Man, that's good. I wanted to run up here on stage. I'm glad I didn't trip. Maybe skip a few steps as I come up. As uh, Taylor Drury said, my name's Robbie. I serve as the missions pastor here at Watkinsville, and I am so excited to be in the room with you today to talk about missions. Um, in a few moments, I'm going to invite four people to join me on stage for a missions panel. But before I do that, I want to talk to you for a few moments about the idea of being sent. Now, as you think about this week, did you know that many of you in the room were sent out on a mission? Maybe you uh, were watching the game or received a phone call or a text and it went something like this. Hey, can you go grab some milk and bread at the store? I forgot to get that this week. Now, that might be a frustrating moment for you, so let me help you think about that differently. You were not given a to-do list. You were actually being sent out on a mission. Well, you may not prefer that type of mission, so let me tell you this morning about the mission that God has given every follower of Jesus. Look with me in the Bible at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 13. Now, while you're getting there, let me provide some context leading up to these verses. Paul is describing both how people can be saved and that the message of salvation is for all people. So read along with me, starting in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So Paul is essentially telling us how the message of the gospel actually gets to those who have not heard. I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting in this text that in all the steps of getting the gospel to the nations that Paul actually mentions the idea of being sent. This might be a little stretch, but I, I wonder if Paul got this idea from Jesus or one of his disciples. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Gospels is found in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. You don't have to turn there, but John 20, 21, it's a moment where Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the disciples, they hadn't seen him yet. They're locked up in a room, it says, for fear of the Jews. And then all of a sudden, Jesus pops in. You ever had someone pop in your house? It can be a little awkward uh, you're a little caught off guard. Could you imagine? Jesus took that to another level. He all of a sudden appears in their midst, and it's interesting what he says. It probably caught the disciples off guard. Maybe they were expecting him to say something different. But this is what he says. He says, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So here is the big idea this morning. We serve a missionary God who sends out his people. Jesus came to this earth to rescue us from our sins. He's the missionary God. So we serve a missionary God who sends out his people. Now, a few moments ago, we sang a song called Let the Nations Be Glad. This comes from Psalm 67 and is speaking of a day when all nations and all peoples will praise the Lord. In fact, it says, let the peoples praise you, O Lord. I'll let all the peoples praise you. Now, but here's the problem. That is not the reality of our world today. Not all peoples are praising the Lord. Did you know in our world today that three billion people, three billion, are unreached with the gospel? Now, when I say three billion are unreached, I'm not talking only about lostness. I'm also talking about that these people have little or no access to the good news of Jesus. In fact, many people ask me, Robbie, why would we send people all the way across the globe when we have lost people right here in our backyard? That's a good question. And my first response is, yes, let's go do something about that. Let's share the good news with everyone that's around us. But I want to I tell a story and give you perspective of why we should take the gospel to those who have never had a chance to hear. So last summer, uh, we were doing a missions project, and we went up to Jittery Joe's, 
to just see how many people we knew in Jittery Joes were followers of Jesus. Now that can be hard, only the Lord knows the hearts, but a lot of Watkins, but a lot of you guys hang out at Jittery Joes. So we went into the coffee shop that day, and I think the Lord showed us favor. Out of the 14 people hanging out in that coffee shop, 10 of them we knew to be followers of Jesus. So think about this, if you're a lost person in Oconee County or Clark County and you happen to go into Jittery Joe's that day, you would have a lot of people who could tell you about Jesus. You'd have a lot of access to the gospel. Maybe you see someone praying, maybe you see people talking about Jesus in their Bible study, maybe someone comes and shares the good news with you. You have a lot of access. But think about this, if you were born in a place like the southern part of Nepal, your access to the good news of Jesus would be quite different. You know, you could be born, live your whole life, and die. And it's possible if you lived in Nepal that you never would once interact with a single Christian or pass by a single church. So as you get in your car to go home today or go to lunch, maybe pay attention to how many churches you pass by as you go home. Nepal, uh, people in Nepal, many have lived their lives, entire lives, and have never had the chance to hear the story of Jesus once. That's not okay. So it's not only about lostness. Being unreached is essentially about people's access to the good news. That's why we send people to those places. So around four years ago, God led our church family to do something about this problem. God led us to adopt an unreached, unengaged people group in Nepal. The name of the people group are, are the Bing people, is the Bing people of Nepal. And we took our first trip there in 2019, 2019, and our hope was just to find the, the first Bing village. And the Lord led us, eventually led us to our first Bing village, and we sat down with the first family. We walked into the village, and we sat down with the first family that we met. And so we just got to know them. We learned about their culture and their religion, their Hindu people, and God opened the door for us to share the story of Jesus with them. And there was a moment that happened that just really shook me and kind of changed my perspective forever. And it was this. After we shared the story of Jesus, not a single one of them, we were told, had ever heard that story before. They didn't even know the name of Jesus. And, I, and I had, as the missions pastor, I've heard that before. I've heard David Platt talk about that statistic that people, there's people around the globe who haven't heard. And it's one thing to hear that. It's another thing to sit right across from someone who has never had one chance to respond to the good news of Jesus. It shook me. It shook me. But I'm here to share some good news. So in the last four years since we took that trip in 2019, there are so many stories I could tell you of God bringing some Bing people to faith in Christ. And I wish I could tell you every one of these stories, but at least I can share some names with you. They'll be on the screen behind me. Names like, and I wish I had time to tell you about these people and their stories and how we met them and how we learned that each of them, except for one, have not heard the story of Jesus until we told it to them. But church, I want to celebrate with you today that every name that you see on this screen have trusted Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Amen. Amen. Once, once unreached with the gospel, each of them have had their lives changed for eternity because this church family prayed. We got on our knees and prayed. Because this church family sacrificially gave to the work of missions so that we could be sent out and tell them the good news of Jesus. But there are still so many more who have not heard. There's a lot of work for us to do as a church, for the Big C Church, to go and reach the nations. Now, what does this mean for you? Not every one of us will get on a plane and, and go to Nepal. Some of you should. You're in this room and God's leading you to take the good news of Jesus to the nation. Some of you already have. I'm seeing faces in the room that have been there before, but some of you should go. And although some of us are not called to go, every single Christian in this room, every follower, we can all pray. We can all give something. And we can all commission people out and send them out for the glory of God and for the good of all people. So let me wrap up my time with where I began. We serve a missionary God who sends out his people. And my hope for you today is that you will take just one small step towards getting involved in the mission of God until everyone's heard. Now, behind me, there are five banners, and these banners represent 
the five different ways that you can get involved in missions. And ins instead of just hearing that from me, uh, I'd love to invite uh, the panel up at this time. I'd love for you to hear from people from our church family. You guys make your way up on stage and, and have a seat. Um, and before I introduce them, let me uh, direct your attention to this passport that was on your chair when you walked in this morning. So in this passport, uh, by the way, don't take this to the international airport. You will not get through security. They won't allow you with this one, so don't blame me if you try it. But uh, this is um, helpful for your next steps to get involved in missions. The first page you see there, uh, there's ways for you to find out about the mission trips we're taking next year. There's some prayer points uh, in this uh, passport that Carlos will lead us through in a moment. And then the last page, there's a blank page about engaging the mission. And there's a QR code for you to take a next steps on how to do that. Um, but as these guys are sharing uh, here on the panel, maybe the Lord would speak to you through them. You want to take some notes down, please do that. We also have people out in the commons area that would love to help you take the next step. So guys, thanks for joining me on stage up here. I'm excited for our church family to, to hear from you and share just about how the Lord has led y'all to get connected in the Great Commission. Uh, this is Cameron Smith. He's going to be talking about uh, praying, and then Sam Perry is going to be talking about sending, Kirsten Brucker about going, and Liz Albers is going to be talking about mobilization. And so guys, uh, I'd love for our church to hear just how Lord, the Lord led you to, to get involved in missions and uh, how it's, it's changed your life to do that. So Cameron, share with us a little bit about prayer. Thank you, Robbie, and good morning, Watkinsville. I do want to talk to you about um, prayer as it relates to missions, and we're each going to kind of take a section and kind of walk through some things. Um, and to provide some context, um, my wife Jennifer and our family, we've been here for a number of years, and I would have to honestly say that um, originally prayer was maybe a, a good idea or something that maybe we would get around to, but over time and kind of walking through uh, difficult life situations, prayer just became critical, mm. became mandatory for us um, as a family. And so we just began to really be tuned in to opportunities to learn more about prayer, getting into God's word, what does it actually teach and say about prayer. And one of the things that <clears throat> I kind of, it's an aha moment, I guess, for me, um, was in looking at what Paul said about prayer and what he asked the churches to do. Paul, greatest missionary ever, asked churches that he founded to pray for him, mm. right? That just kind of, when I saw it, blew me away that he is setting up a model for us to follow, and that is that the senders praying for the sent, yeah. right? And specifically, um, Paul, when you notice what he prayed for and what he asked them to pray for, Paul believed that because churches prayed, he would be strengthened, that his ministry would be made effective, and that people would come to know the Lord because of what the churches were doing, Amen. right? So I'm thankful to be a part of Watkinsville. I'm thankful that that's what we're doing and what we're about. That's good. Thanks, All right. uh, I'm Sam. I've been here seven years at Watkinsville. Uh, I love the fact that our pastor and our staff and our church uh, loves missions, and it's important. Missions is important here, but... Um, just like the church I grew up in, it was very evangelical and missions-minded, but, but at the same time, as just a, a member of the congregation, I felt like it was almost still foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, missions is something that our church does and something that's important, but I don't know that I had like a real personal connection with missions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got early started into uh, a, a small group here at our church, and our group was just uh, a bunch of young parents. I think we had our, our first or our second child maybe, and, and we were learning uh, that phase of our life with some other couples, and we became close friends with the folks in our small group. And one evening at small group, um, Zach and Lauren Dixon, our good friends, they said, hey, we're, we're gonna move across the world and become missionaries in Northern Europe. I was like, what did you just say? <laughs> um, you know, we're in this stage of life where we have small kids and our family is here and our work is here and our church is here. Why would you get up and leave? And I think at that point, it became maybe personal to me. And I thought to myself, what role do I have in this? Mm. Um, in church, I, I was never necessarily convicted to become a missionary. 
but I was, I, I was sitting in church. I was convicted to support missions where yeah. we could. And I said, how can I partner with them? And how can I um, encourage our friends who are doing this? I mean, what a sacrifice that Zach and Lauren and other people in our church are making to, to spread the gospel. What's my role in this? And, and so we, we support missions through our work um, and what we do. And we look for ways to say, how can we come alongside you and encourage you and partner with you? Because what's more important than, than people hearing the name of Jesus and the gospel continuing to thrive in, in places where it, it never has been heard before. So that's, that's just something that stuck out to me. I said, this is a, a way that we can do that and how, how we can partner there. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm a third year college student at the University of Georgia, and I didn't truly start understanding um, God's heart for the nations and for all peoples until about two years ago, my freshman year. God really just through his word, um, seeing from Genesis to Revelation, his heart for all peoples and um, the importance of the Great Commission. And I got to also see people faithfully through this church uh, going and living that out in their lives. And uh, I got the opportunity my freshman year to go um, at the end, right before the summer, to Honduras for a week. And through that, I saw all of this that I was reading in the word and just seeing God become, or he is, but getting to actually see it uh, for myself, that he is the same God in this different cultural context, in a different language, to different people. And it just really... uh, opened a whole door for me um, to partner with him in this work, to know that this good news has saved my life and that I get to faithfully share it with those that need to hear it in different places around the world. And so since then, I've gotten to go to Boston this past spring break with our church for a week and then got to be in uh, Central Asia for six weeks this summer. And we got to partner with um, just uh, the missionaries there and just building relationships with local students and working professionals there. And just to see the utter darkness in certain places and contexts where the gospel is not being proclaimed and the truth is not being shared. And so getting to sit across, like Robbie was saying, getting to be face to face with someone that has never heard the goodness of Jesus. And uh, it's just, there's nothing like it. And so um, it's just a beautiful truth that we get to share with people. My name is Liz Albers. I grew up in a very missions-minded church. I went on trips every year in the summer from the time I was in middle school on, spent my summers in college interning at a church plant in New York, and really just always felt like my role in missions was to go. Then I got married, got a job, had kids, and suddenly that all changed. And I had to figure out what my role in the Great Commission looked like as a mom. Um, And so for me, the last few years, the Lord has been moving me towards a role of mobilization. And mobilization is just finding a way to make missions an everyday part of your life and get the people already in your circles involved in that as well. It can involve the things we've already talked about, like going, sending, praying. You just make it a group project instead of a solo effort. Mm -hmm. I think the most effective way to be a mobilizer is to find something you are already passionate about, whether that's a country, a people group, a missionary family, and get the people around you involved in that as well. For my husband and I, that's Norway. We went six years ago on a short-term trip and really connected with the IMB missionaries there and developed a really close friendship with them. Recently, we were able to connect them with Robbie and our church is gonna send a group to Norway next summer, which we're super excited about. Um, That's not what mobilization looks like all the time. Um, Sometimes it's a little more uh, local. We hosted a college group for two years that sat in our home every Monday night and faithfully prayed for international missions. Um, I've kept the connections with some of the girls that graduated out of that group um, and are now entering their first adult jobs. And we talk a lot about what it looks like to live missionally in a professional setting. Um, So whatever your involvement in missions looks like, engage the people around you in that process. And that's all mobilization is. Yeah, that's great. Thank you guys for sharing. I, I, for, for those of you who are mathematicians in the room, we did have uh, one category left out, and that's the welcome piece. Um, and essentially, I, I think we may have run out of matching stools. Maybe that's why we couldn't have the next person. But essentially, well, the welcoming ministry of missions is that God is mobilizing and moving the world to more reached areas uh, of the world, like Athens, Georgia. Uh, Joel and I were actually at a, a Uh, international outreach a couple years ago we met three young men who were from the southern part of Nepal they were here you know doing studies and and I just was blown away that's not typically a place where where people can go from to 
uh, to Athens, Georgia. And so just God's bringing people to places where they have a greater access to the gospel. So um, that's just another way that you can get involved in missions is welcoming international people and students that are here. Um, so as we kind of close our time and wrap this panel up, I, I would love for people in the room to just hear um, there's some barriers maybe to getting involved. Maybe they don't know how to get involved and they're like, what's my next step? Maybe share some practical ways that people could get involved uh, in the work. Right, so barriers to, um, to prayer, we would have to include just life, right? You, the alarm clock goes off and before your feet, your feet hit the floor, your duties, responsibilities, things you have to do um, are going through your mind, right? So that, that happens. I think there's also, um, we would have to say from, from God's word, there's a spiritual battle against prayer. Ephesians 6, Paul talks about the armor of God and lists that out. And at, at the end of that says, put on that armor so that you can pray, right? Mm -hmm. He's setting up the, the battle line yeah. so that you can pray. Um, uh, another thing would be maybe we don't know how to get started, don't know how to get traction with that and maybe feel kind of overwhelmed by, wow, I don't have an hour a day to, to devote to, to prayer. So just some things that are practical and um, there, are, there are others and I'd like to hear from you guys and, and learn from you too, but there, there are some practical things that can be put in place in your life that will kind of give some teeth to your prayer life, right? Part of that is praying with others. Look for opportunities to plug into prayer that's happening as part of what we're doing here at Watkinsville. Um, that's going to be upcoming. Um, there are special times. There are ongoing prayer gatherings like on Tuesday, every other Tuesday morning in the 15, 1590 house. Mm -hmm. This Tuesday. Uh, this Tuesday. This Tuesday. Um, happens to be at 6.15 in the morning for uh, early birds. But I'm going to tell you something about that prayer meeting. Mm. There were eight names on that list that were that was displayed a few minutes ago is a name we want to see on that list. Amen. It's that specific and it's that real. Nisha is a, a wife of, of one of the men there. Pray for her. We are praying for her. She has recently um, agreed to go to church, has been opposed to that in the past, right? So that's the reality of what we're doing. Um, another thing that is beneficial, I'm just going to give you a quick example here. Um, if it's not simple, I'm not going to remember it, not going to do it, right? So a simple, quick way to divide up prayer time is to say Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Monday, I'm going to pray for missions, right? I'm going to be connected with a missionary and missions around the world. That's a Monday. Wednesday is Watkinsville. I'm going to pray for a pastor, Watkinsville pastor on Wednesday. Friday, friend or family who needs to know Jesus, Right? It's just a way to organize it and, and take good. five minutes on those days. Okay? I'm going to be quiet and turn it over. <laughs> we might okay. need to end with that one. That was a good one right there. <laughs> um, one of the things uh, I think that might be a barrier for, for some of us is like, hey, uh, what do I do? Mm. I don't necessarily maybe know a missionary. Well, our small group at the time, we said, what, you know, they're leaving the comforts of our area. Why don't we put together like a local care package for them and ship it over to them? Um, I think that you told me at some point one of the top five reasons why missionaries uh, leave and come back home maybe and stop their ministry is because they just lose the support group, mm -hmm. I guess, and they feel like uh, they're on their own. Um, and so we put together a care package and sent it to them. Well, after the second hour, I had, I think, three people come up to me, three parents, and they said, hey, uh, you don't know how much that meant to my daughter or my yeah. son that y'all sent them and just let them know that you were thinking about them and that you're praying for them and how encouraging that was for them. I was like, man, I'm so glad to hear that they appreciate that and that they like that and they just know that there's people that are on their team and they're mm -hmm. partnering with them and they're pulling for them and they're praying for them. Yeah. And I think us as a church, we're called to be encouragers to them. Again, think about uh, how they've sacrificed everything that, again, is that is comfortable here and that's good to them here and that's familiar to go somewhere where they don't know anybody and they don't even speak the language. That's just, yeah. to me, that would be really difficult. And so I'm convicted to support those folks. So that's one way that I think we could be a part. That's great.
Yeah, uh, some common barriers that I know I've faced, especially as a college student, is just uh, the demands that we have just in time in general and how we can get so focused on ourselves and caught up in tunnel vision to what we have before us, especially when I think about um, spring break and summer and having a plethora of time to use it. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, you need to get an internship or a job and like those things are great, don't get me wrong. But I've also been told that there may not be another time in my life that I'm gonna get to go you know, for two months uh, to an unreached place of the world. And I think it's just so important to kind of step back from, you know, your, your resume, from what you're doing and really just look to see like where God wants you um, and sacrificing as we surrender our time to him, he really uses it for his utmost glory. Um, and I think like it is really just the most important thing that we can do. Um, I think oftentimes we count ourselves out from going, uh, but I think instead of asking ourselves like, why should we go? We need to start asking ourselves, why should we stay? Uh, because if we have this good news, we should be joyously wanting to spread it to the ends of the earth because like that's what he's called us to do. And we're sitting in these chairs comfortably being able to listen to this um, and he's commanding us to go. And there's just such joy in being able yeah. to do that. So practically speaking, um, consider going um, in whatever capacity that looks like. I know that there's a lot of different people in the room. You may be a college student and you have opportunities to go over spring break or summer. You may be a working professional, but I think everyone at least goes on vacation maybe once a year for a week. Um, and so using one week out of your 52 to surrender it to God. Maybe you take your family on a, a mission trip instead of going on a luxurious vacation and just sacrificing and surrendering that um, God uses those things. And he truly, as you see it for yourself and as you experience it, um, he just meets us in that place. And there's really joy in that. I think if most of the parents in the room are honest, one of our biggest barriers to being missions minded is our kids. And I feel that, I have three kids at home and it takes all of my energy during the day to keep my self-destructive tiny humans alive. Um, and there's a lot of people in the room that, that know my kids well and you know how accurate that description can be, um, especially for my younger two. So having missions even on my mind can be difficult. But one thing that we have found very effective in our house is instead of working around our kids, we try to involve them in the missions process as much as possible. And that looks very different depending on the age of your kids. You know, if you have a middle or high schooler, maybe y'all can go on a trip together. My kids are eight, five, and two, so going to Walmart is a big deal, so they will not be going with us to Norway. Um, <laughs> but we can find Norway on a map, and we can look at pictures, and we talk about the Norwegian people, and we pray that the Lord calls them to himself. Um, you know, we're teaching my eight-year-old about money management, so we're talking about the Acts 1-8 offering and the importance of giving to that. Um, and involving our kids in the missions process allows us to stay missions minded on a daily basis, but it's also training the next generation of believers that their faith is something to be shared and not just retained. And that is a really cool process to be a part of as a mom. Mm, that's amazing. Guys, that was good. Thank you so much for sharing. I hope you guys are encouraged. And, you know, often when we think missions or Great Commission, we think about going, and certainly the Great Commission is about going and taking the gospel, but there are so many ways, as you just heard, to get involved in the work of taking the good news of Jesus to those around the globe. I don't know how they will know, but God can work that out. I would ask that you might show your love and appreciation to our partners that have shared with us this morning. You just put your hands together and let them know that uh, they're important to us. There's, uh, this whole morning is overwhelming to me as a pastor here at Watkinsville. This is the third hour that I've been able to sit through and hear the stories of what's going on with our partners. And the thing that I realized from early this morning to right now is that these are not just our partners. These are our people. We didn't hire professionals to come in today to try to pump us up about missions. What you are hearing today are stories and prayer requests from our people. When I hear those testimonies today, I'm hearing from, you're hearing from people that just a few weeks ago were seated in these chairs in this room. 
you are hearing from people that were seated just a few years ago in the chairs of the building that we used to call the Life Building. And you're hearing from people that a few years ago sat at some point in pews in what we call the chapel. And over the years, people who have been here, some grown up here, some spent their college days here, some spent a portion of their careers here, love Jesus, hear the call to take the gospel to the world, and they have responded to that call, and they have gone, and they are living in a new culture and they're saying to us, will you pray for us? And I'm asking you today to pray for our people, your people. Uh, what we're hearing from today, in this panel that sat here in front of us this morning, you, Robbie's on our staff here as a missions pastor, but you're hearing from a longtime school administrator. You're hearing from a private business owner. You're hearing from a college student. You're hearing from someone who has nursing in their background that's a mom of three. You're hearing from our people. You're hearing from folks right here in this room that are saying that missions is a part of how they're living life. Our partners are our people. And I want to ask you right now to go. You knew it was coming, didn't you? But I'm asking you to go this morning. I want to ask you to go to Vietnam this morning. I want to ask you to go to Calgary this morning. I want to ask you to go to Europe and to Africa and to Asia and to Guatemala this morning. How do you do that? Every single country is open today. Every single country is open today to the prayers of God's people. There is no boundary when it comes to prayer. There is no geographical wall that would keep us from being able to enter into some country through prayer. And uh, we can spend a few minutes in Asia today. We can spend a few minutes in Vietnam today by simply calling out to heaven and asking the Spirit of God to break through in those areas. And we've got the specific request. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take some time to go on a journey. You hold in your hand a passport today. And hear this. Our passport is prayer. The way we get into another country is through prayer. What we heard from Nepal, the names that we saw on the page, uh, on this screen earlier, what happened first is that those people were prayed for. Our passport is prayer. Now, when I sit here today, I say I'm overwhelmed. It always, it, it's not just the people that have gone. Maybe you're like this. I'm overwhelmed by the needs like, did you hear Rebecca and Cliff? They said in their prayer request, would you pray for the Uyghur people to come to know Jesus Christ? Now, when I hear that, my flesh says, and Carlos says almost to me, I'm like, that's impossible. I'm like, come on, Cliff. Like, the Uyghur, pray for the Uyghur, Uyghur people to be saved. And I think in my heart, I think, like, like all of them? Like every one of them to be saved. And I, I think through that, and, and early this morning, God took me to a verse in Luke 1, the very beginning of the gospel, very first chapter of the gospel of Luke, and it becomes the backdrop for everything that God does in the gospel of Luke and everything that he's doing right into this very day. And that verse in Luke chapter 1 is this, it is that, with God, all things are possible. And what God does at the very beginning is to tell us, you're a part of something that's impossible, but if you're a part of it with God, then it's possible. And so what we're about to do right now is to call on God who turns the impossible to possible to do that, to do miracles with these requests that we've been given. And so we're going to pray, all right? We're just going to pray. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to work in a, in a very practical way. I'm going to ask you to take your passport 
And these prayer requests that we've heard are begin on page three. They're about three to a page. And we're going to pray out loud. We're going to do this. I'm going to sign you right here to my left. On the floor, right here to my left, you've got page three, all right? Just start lifting those requests to the Lord out loud right now. Just You can take a partner, you can pray alone, but pray aloud and call out to the Lord for those three things right there. To the top, on the top, on my left, you got page four, all right? Today, this hour, page four will be prayed for by you pray aloud with a partner or by yourself just call out to the Lord specifically for these things right here on the floor right here you got page five all right page five on the floor in front of me up top page six right in front of me page six those requests that are just call them out to the Lord pray aloud in this room right here and this to my right you got page seven that's who you're praying for right now and up top to my right Page eight's all on you, all right? You got page eight. Let's take two minutes. Pray aloud. Let there be a roar of prayers in this room and take these specific things to the Lord for these next two minutes. Let's pray. Father, it's a privilege today to pray for our people that have gone. You you hear the prayers. We hear the prayers in this room. We lift them before you knowing that what they're part of is impossible when it comes to us. We're believing that your word is true and your word is reliable. You keep your promises. All things are possible with God. So we're clinging to that. We're praying with that faith today would you grant the desires of our people's hearts Lord would you do miracles a lot of different time zones represented in these stories today some are laying down to sleep some are midday some are already asleep some are right where we are wherever people are would you supernaturally somehow bring breakthrough and encouragement to them let them know some reminder some way of getting to them father that they are not forgotten that they are loved that they are supported that we are holding this end of the rope as they go we pray lord that you would grant to them uh, practical answers to prayer that they would see and be able to believe and know today again that you're at work you're in the saving business you're changing lives would you help 
Lord, in the barriers that different cultures bring, we ask, God, that there would, there would be fruit for the word that's being shared and courage from the Spirit in our lives. And uh, so, Lord, we lay these requests before you and we pray we might have the joy of hearing how these prayers are being answered in the days ahead. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. And look this way. I'm asking you to remember this today that our partners are our people. That's who's gone. And remember that prayer is our passport to every place. On any day, at any time, you can enter a country through your prayers. I want to I wanna exhort you over these next few weeks and months to consider how God would use you to give so that people can go. We heard mention just momentarily a minute ago, a mom talking about teaching her children about the Acts 1-8 offering. The Acts 1-8 offering is a part of our culture here. It's a part of our fabric. We, we every year take a offering that is over and above our regular tithes and offerings. We do that over December, January, and February. You can give at any time. You just mark those gifts, Acts 1-8, and that is how we fund what we do in taking the gospel to the world. And half of that goes to International Mission Board, Two of those families, the Fergusons and the Moors, they are on the field through the support of the International Mission Board. And, and so there's a, a, a half of that offering goes to that. A fourth of the offering goes to work with the North American Mission Board. And then a fourth of that offering goes to hands-on projects of taking the gospel to the world through people in our church. We gave $290,000 last year to that missions offering. Pray with me, see how God might use you to see that go over $300,000 this coming year. If every one of us gave $300 apiece over those three months, we would be able to see that goal reached and beyond. And I want to ask you to consider going, like literally going. Pray, but go. There are 22 people that we have sent out, 36 if you add the kids, since 2019. Our people that have gone with their life to live in a different part of the world to share the gospel. God may be calling you or your family for you to be the next person to go. Last year we saw more than 120 people go on short-term trips a week. 10 days, two months, three months, a semester. In this passport that you have, if you open up to the front page, there's a QR code that if you scan that, it'll take you to a, an itinerary there of a calendar of opportunities over the next year. A, a person came to me this morning between services saying, I just started taking the steps to be able to go to Puerto Rico next year on one of our trips. You heard about the trip to Norway. This is a great way to spend your afternoon is looking at the possibilities that will come up as you scan that and it'll show you what you can do to be a part of going short-term, mid-term in the coming year. We'd love to see more than 200 people go this coming year in some kind of short-term or mid-term trip. And then maybe just say, Somehow, some way, I want to be more involved in taking the gospel to the world. Help me do that. When you turn to the page that says engage, there's a QR code there. If you scan it, it takes you to a very simple form that gives you a place where you can just mark how you could take just one more step and being more engaged in fulfilling the Great Commission. How would God use you in being obedient? to making disciples of all nations. That's what's in front of us today. I want to ask you to stand out in the commons. There are people at tables there, the missions walls there. You can find out more information today. Maybe you need to tell somebody what God's done in your heart. Spend some time in this passport learning what God might have you do next. And before we go, let's sing together this prayer of commitment to the Lord. God's lead us.